Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so just about the United, States, uh, United Nations SDGs and um, why I think they are an invaluable tool, really, in creating the places we need and the places we want. I think, first of all, as with sort of all toolkits, guides, manuals, and codes, let's look at why on earth we need it in the first place. And I think why do we need the SDGs is probably because of a cheery reason to start with is the way we are living at the moment is killing us. The way we've gone about shaping our urban settlements is creating a huge life um, disparity in our life expectancy between places um, which also leads to social inequality and social injustice. Um, this is a chart of life expectancy in Scotland, just by way of example, uh, demonstrating that people in some areas have about 10 more healthy years than their neighbours. And this social injustice is prevalent globally on a much more stark scale. The way we've shaped places um, has also given us an urban loneliness crisis. Um, some surveys have identified that 15% of people feel they cannot depend on a single person. And this is just one example of a growing mental health crisis in urban environments we face today, and one that's come, come about in part because of how we've designed cities. And by way of illustration, studies have found that older women who walked at least 1.5 hours a week had significantly better um, knowledge, attention, memory, judgment, reasoning, problem solving, decision making, and comprehension, and less cognitive decline than women who walked less than 40, uh, walked less than 40 minutes a week. And the amount, of people, the amount of people walk in places is, of course, inextricably linked to the design of that place. So design directly affects our mental health. We've planned places that are not allowing traditional community centres to thrive, um, strangling them with roads or um, undermining them with satellite shopping developments, for example. And the cities we've designed are not open to all. Many cities and urban areas are not, full, are not fully inclusive or accessible. And this is not simply concerning pedestrian accessibility, as this image is highlighting, but also inclusive access to opportunity for everyone, regardless of ability, sage, uh, sage, sex, age, or background. Starkly as well, the, the urban environments we've created globally um, are largely unfit for urban childhoods, despite the fact that we know successful <coughs> cities are desirable places to spend your whole life through um, infancy, childhood, adulthood, parenthood, and old age. And the way we've designed um, places is certainly a factor in the huge variation in quality of life we see globally. And if we don't resolve this, we're, we're essentially going to hardwire in this social injustice for generations to come. One I focus a lot on is that the way we travel on the whole is simply killing us. Because the way we've designed cities in many areas has produced an inactivity crisis. People no longer need to move going about their daily lives, making doing nothing one of the biggest killers in society. And as well as killing us through inactivity, the way we've developed our transportation systems globally is directly killing us every day. <laughs> 3,700 people die in road collisions um, every day. That's 1.3 fatalities um, on the world's road every year. Low-income countries have just 1% of the world's vehicles, but account for 13% of road traffic fatalities. Um, road collisions are also the number one cause of death in people aged 15 to 14 globally. All this, despite the fact um, that when we apply ourselves to eradicating such injustices, we are very effective at doing so. And of course, the planet is burning. The way we've designed the urban environment is, of course, part of the problem, but also and must be part of the solution. In terms of the mistakes of the past, they don't have to be repeated, of course. The way we shape cities that, that are growing fastest will affect generations to come locally and globally. We know cities around the world are growing at a pace and to a size which has until now been unprecedented. Perpetuating the mistakes, especially around sort of car oriented development um, at this scale, for example, would simply be tragic for people and cities. The red circle here is showing us where the, concentration, the greatest concentration of emerging megacities is, and by extension, where the highest concentration of people is, but also globally where the worst air quality is. So not to put too fine a point on it, we're in a race for our lives at the moment, and we're losing. In my mind, though, as designers, it is our gift and responsibility to focus our attention globally on harnessing design to tackle the most pressing urban crises of the day. So the UN gave us 12 years. So we've got about nine years left. So nine years to take action against climate change to keep global war warming at a maximum of 1.5 degrees. Put simply, we have to start seeing this as the greatest design challenge in history. This 12-year deadline we had to make meaningful reduction in emissions is longer than it took Apple to get the concept of a smartphone in the hands of more than half the world's population. No legislation was needed to drive this meteoric rise, just the intense allure of compelling design that changed people's behavior through making something desirable. Good design doesn't just make things more usable and elegant. It changes behavior and delivers action. 
if we're going to meet these UN deadlines, we have to design cities in a way that makes people want to do things that are good for them, good for the city, and good for the environment. And taking transport as one example, we know we need to start travelling around cities in ways that are, are more active, more space efficient, and have zero emissions to tackle the crisis we've just been looking at. To create this shift, we have to influence behaviour. We have to make what is good for the environment, good for people, and good for, the soci and good for society essentially fun. This is because where people have lived in places in which the space between buildings has been um, conformed to the commodity of the car for such a long time, their behaviours are shaped accordingly, with the result that this way of life is now viewed by many as their culture. This makes the issue of changing behaviours a great deal more challenging, as people don't see the sort of urban design improvements that we often implement um, as improvement or urban design schemes or trying to make things better. Instead, they see them as an attack on their culture. And I've floated this idea at um, the conference in Birmingham this year, but it's for this reason I think we need to approach urban design projects with an understanding that design and behaviour change aren't separate things. We need to compel people to change by making what's best for cities and society far more attractive. In short, we need to marry self-interest and societal good and develop cities, as I would put it, against hedonistic urbanism. Um, it's basically making what's good for the planet the most, the most fun option, and people queue up for it. So... Taking this from theory back to practice, um, as, as Paul's highlighted, the, here are the, the 17 SDGs that we've seen already. Um, they're overarching targets, ambitions um, for everyone, from governments to citizens, to help them assess and achieve a more sustainable future. They're action-orientated, um, in their own words, and ubiquitous to help sort of global efforts align. I think we should, we should use these goals to assess decision-making and develop design briefs for places so we can create the places we want but also the places we need to survive. I think as designers, they're especially useful because we're almost out of time to win this battle against climate change and we really need to start the process of climate recovery. Talks, policy changes, government action, it takes time. And global talks like COP26 and COP25 in Madrid, which has just happened, take even longer. Claire O'Neill, who was until recently the president of uh, COP26, of the climate talks in Glasgow later this year, made it very clear that global governmental talks are not the solutions by themselves. With the annual UN talks being dogged by endless rows over agendas, who's going to pay, and insufficient attention for funding or adaptation. Importantly though, and something the UK must resolve for Glasgow in COP26 in November, she said that last year's talks in Madrid were particularly awful. Um, and while half a million climate action protesters gathered in the streets, she sat in plenary sessions where global negotiators debated whether to, uh, the meeting should be classified as informal or informal-informal. So with that in mind, I think we have to rely on design a lot more. And as urban designers, it's, it's, it's key that we, we look at this, um, with obviously policy working in the background. So I see the SDGs as a, as a vital kite mark, in a way, to hold designs and decisions against, to make sure that we are doing what we need to do to change hearts and minds, change behaviours, and deliver the places we really want. Looking at each of the goals in detail, we can start to build a picture of what these mean for us as designers. I've sketched out a few ideas here as well, um, but I am invite the discussion later to help build this up and sort of co-create this sort of uh, urban designer checklist. So just looking, I will go through them in detail. Um, <laughs> no poverty, number one. <laughs> so as designers, what are we doing to, to create um, shared prosperity? <laughs> Is what we're doing best for business from an evidence-led perspective? Um, so are we thinking about sort of incubators for um, 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 as part of developments? Are we prioritising walking and cycling? Because we know people spend 40% more over the course of a week when they walk and cycle rather than drive. And are we making just pleasurable places to be in? <laughs> SDG 2, what are we doing to eradicate hunger in our urban environments? As designers, are we creating a public realm that allows for community food growth? Do we have communal or community dining in developments um, along the lines of co-housing model? And obviously a key one, SDG 3, we need to promote and further people's um, health and well-being with how we shape places in cities as a primary development objective. As designers, are we prioritising walking and cycling, creating cities around low traffic neighbourhood uh, models, only allowing perm permeability for zero emission vehicles, designing for a 10 to 15 mile an hour design speed, uh, creating social spaces in the public realm, bringing, living, bring, bringing the living room outside, and designing an urban foodscape for healthy eating habits, for example. Number four is, sort of how do we improve access to good education and maximise the value of education? 
So we know, we know students score more highly in tests when they walk, to cycle, walk or cycle to school than they do if they're driven. So how do we hardwire this, hardwire this into development practices? And looking at sort of creating school streets is key here, as well as developing sort of walk-to programs for, um, akin to the ones that sort of living streets do in the UK. On to number five, really. It's flying by. <laughs> we need to be acutely aware of the environments we create um, and that people feel comfortable in some spaces when others don't. So designing for, um, the cities for city life has to be the driver. And we need to see our proposal through the many lenses of society, children, mothers, fathers, pensioners, rather than simply through our own experiences. So in the design process, we've got to co-create these places with a team that represents the society we're working in and make propositions that highlight the wonderful complexity and diversity of cities. Number six is all about sort of clean access to water. <laughs> and the lack of free drinking water in cities is a growing concern. Um, not only does it encourage increased use of single plastics, of course, but it also creates a less inclusive um, place. And this is further exacerbated um, with the removal of public toilets as a regular occurrence in the public realm. So as part of design um, proposals, we have to include bottle fills and drinking fountains. Public toilets should be reinstated or, or installed, or community schemes developed to allow the use of private facilities. Also, surface water should be treated on site. Rain gardens in the public realm, suds in development um, um, need to be the priority setting. On to seven, are we creating places that allow us to minimise resource consumption, um, as well as places that harness natural energy? So there's lots of things we could think of for this and, and how our designs might reflect this. Are we looking at prioritising energy-efficient transport, such as walking and cycling? Are we capturing kinetic energy from streets and footsteps, maybe? Um, are we creating sort of public spaces with free solar phone charging points to allow sort of convivial spaces that also maximise energy? Work and economic growth, to me, is all about social justice, um, and access to opportunity. We, we must allow access to opportunities for all through effective transport strategies and urban design. This means creating affordable public transport systems and prioritising free and cheap ones, such as walking and cycling. We also have to create diverse and inclusive communities with blind tenure development and affordable housing in city centres. Of course, the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So innovation, for me, this number nine is incredibly powerful. We've had a trial and experiment with different approaches to infrastructure, and this should be encouraged and enabled by governments in order to expedite solutions to common urban issues. This means we cannot rely on design guides. We have to test, innovate, trial, experiment in partnership with communities. We must apply behavioural science to urban design to affect behaviour change and not simply rely on predictable behaviour change programmes. Number 10 is all about sort of having to shape places that provide equal opportunities for all. Cities should be enjoyable for people from all backgrounds, with all levels of ability, and to all ages. <clears throat> and when we think about the equal city, we have to think about access inequality, climate, shade, opportunity, income, age inequality, health inequality, mental health inequality, and so on. And this is something we should start hardwiring into our urban design frameworks with the sustainable development goals. Number 11, we're over the hump. It's clearly at the heart of what we do, um, as Paul has already said. We need to shape cities that enable people to go about their daily lives, in a healthy and sustainable manner as part of the community. There's a, there's a very well-known quote that sustainability is like teenage sex. Lots of people say they're doing it, few are doing it, and those who are doing it are doing it very well. So I think for this, we really need to start doing it well. We need to create relaxed and climate-safe places that engender a sense of community. We need livable neighbourhoods that provide people with, with their daily needs within a short walk. We need to plan and design cities so a child can walk from their home safely, by themselves, to the local shops, buy an ice cream, and get back before it melts. And that's the idea of the popsicle city. And we need to shape streets that invite people to relax, exercise, and enjoy themselves with friends. Number 12 is all about sustainable consumption and production. It's about promoting resource and energy efficiency, sustainable infrastructure, and providing access to basic services, decent jobs, and better quality of life for all. It's quite all-encompassing when, when you read down into it. So for me, it, it, what jumped out was sort of prioritising energy efficiency and sustainable infrastructure, embedding green space and habitat in places, eliminating carbon use and creating zero emission cities and neighbourhoods. Essentially, you could argue what it all boils down to, SDG 13, is, is climate action. But what does that mean for us as urban designers? So essentially, we are in a climate emergency. And, 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 and the best things for the climate need to be encouraged, invited and allowed. The worst things for our climate need to be discouraged, expensive, laborious, and essentially a total bloody bore. Number 14, are we ensuring we're not putting surface water 
into the combined sewer and, and risking discharge into natural watercourses at times of intense rainfall. To do so, we have to uh, manage all surface water in natural ways through rain garden sun, suds, disconnecting drain pipes, and, and, and through planting in, on our, in, our, in our public realm. In the most basic sense, cities need to be designed first and foremost to sustain life. As such, human beings have to be the principal design driver and priority for every urban project. We have to deliver places that reflect this and, and are connected to nature and that are full of biodiversity and habitat. We also have to prioritise people and space for life over everything else in the public realm. <laughs> so much in this one for me. Um, are we allowing people to live with dignity and community? Are we shaping towns and cities that are just? As designers, we, um, we have to be concerned with social justice. And cities and developments are often really unfair, as, as I see them. Access to opportunity in, in many parts of the UK is often predicated on car ownership because of how places are shaped, being inaccessible for those who choose to walk, cycle, and take public transport. This makes the system unfair. Public and active travel has many benefits for society, so we should deliver social justice and design, and design this in from the start. Whoever makes the best choices for society should be rewarded, and opportunities should be open um, and, and, and equal. So nearly there. Final one. We all know enough um, to know that we shouldn't and cannot do this alone. We have to work across sectors, co-create solutions to urban problems. Working with people, the private sector, the third sector, government, community groups, to shape solutions that reflect the diverse quality, the diverse, the diverse quality of cities and our urban environments. So as designers, we have to build teams for projects for a variety of, from people from a variety of backgrounds, disciplines and professions, co-create and appoint local people to the design team, and mix it up and work with artists and charities to add social value. So a useful framework for the places we need, I, should, I would say, um, is putting it lightly. But in sort of, by way of summing it up, society does so much for perceived health benefit um, and, and the health benefit of our planet, in a way, the sort of a surge of veganism we, we, we've seen this year, um, it's, it's just that, really. The idea of Jai, Jan Jai January, again, it's kind of the society getting behind a, a project to, to imp increase our quality of life. White bread. We reject so many products like white bread because we know it to be unhealthy for us, but also because it's really dull. <laughs> Yet we're still largely unambivalent about maintaining towns and cities that are unhealthy for people, unhealthy for business, unhealthy for society, not to mention the environment. I'd say we, st we need to start rejecting places that are killing us and burning our planet and harness the power of design to solve global crises and champion sustainable development goals. So as, as urban designers, we need to lead the way in creating the places we require and support development that actively engages in, with what we need and delivers the places we want. Thanks very much.